We're continuing on in our series on the Sermon on the Mount. Kingdom living in a fallen world. Today we're talking about God requires moral purity to be taken seriously. I don't think that there's an issue in our world that reveals the decay more than immorality that is plaguing this world. When we find that legislation is being passed which promotes immorality, changes the definition of marriage, honors those who are um, not in a monogamous husband, wife, male, female, never altered state, when we find that those people are being put down, and we find that those who are living in perverted, unbiblical lives are being promoted, that just gives us a little indication of how far we've fallen as a nation. And that Christians are writing books talking about why homosexuality is biblical also cries out about the decay of the church. Well, we're going to be talking about a touchy topic this morning, the topic of adultery, the topic of sexual purity. This sermon is going to be PG-13, so um, if you have children in here and you, you don't want them hearing that, you might want them downstairs. I will try and, and make it as responsible and as bland as possible so that it's not to unduly offend, but it is going to be an offensive sermon. Would you stand with me as we read from Scripture, Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 1 through 11, and then skipping over to verse 27 through 30. Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he, has, when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Verse 27. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. You may be seated. The two commands are the command of the Old Testament and the New Testament command in the Beatitude. The first one is uh, commandment number seven of the Ten Commandments clearly states you shall not commit adultery. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 14. Beatitude number 6 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. It's interesting, isn't it, that Jesus says, You've heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery, but I say to you. And the reason that he did that was because the historical view was the letter of the law, not the intent. The historical view of the Ten Commandments, you shall not commit adultery, was the letter of the law, not the intent of the law. 
the Old Testament commandment was historically limited to the physical act. We also find this in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 18, where the Ten Commandments are again reiterated, you shall not commit adultery. Adultery was historically understood as the sexual union of a man with a married woman. Any man, whether it was a married man or a single man with a married woman. The Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament defined adultery this way, or described it this way. Adultery was normally defined in terms of the married status of the woman involved in any such act. In other words, sexual intercourse of a married man with, a un, with an unmarried woman would usually be regarded as fornication. That Greek word for fornication is pornea, from which we get pornography. But sexual intercourse of either an unmarried or a married man with someone else's wife was regarded as adultery, both on the part of the man as well as the woman. But it was the status of the woman that defined whether it was adultery or not. Leon Morris, in the Gospel according to Matthew, in Pillar Commentary, made this statement. He says, in the, in the ancient world, generally it was held that a married man could have sexual adventures as long as they did not involve a married woman, which would mean violating the rights of her husband. A woman, however, was expected to have no such relations. She should be chaste before marriage and faithful after it. Lest you think that that's so old school, we still have that standard today. It's okay for men to be players, but not okay for women. And lest you think the feminist movement's all over that, they're not. They don't say a word about it. Magic Johnson can have his encounters, and he's almost praised for it. But if a woman does that, she's called all kinds of derogatory names. We still have that standard. It is not a just standard. It's not a good standard in any form of the word. Jesus, by saying, but I say to you, widened the scope of adultery to include the very longings of the heart. He did not leave it to the sexual act itself, to the physical act, but he made it a heart issue. Matthew 5, 28, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus identified the heart as the seat of adultery. He also reiterated that kind of a statement in Matthew chapter 15 and verse 19, where he said, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. All these things come out of the heart. Well, we have a hard time thinking, well, what's the heart? If you ask a child what the heart is, the heart's that little muscle inside you that beats. But yes, that's a heart. But that's not the heart that Jesus is talking about. The heart is the invisible part of a person which reveals who he or she really is. It is the will, the values, the thoughts, the desires, and so on of the real person. Our body isn't the real us. We, we take so much time fixing up the outward body, which is to decay, and we spend very little time fixing up the real us. Because we're more concerned with what people can see than what God can see. Jesus wants, to t wants us to take a good look at the heart. And what he tells us is the very act of looking lustfully at a woman reveals the heart of an adulterer. There is this thought in the secular world, and I think it's even crept into the church to some degree, that says it's okay to look, just don't touch. 
it's not okay to look. On the other side, I've talked to ungodly men who say, well, I've already looked, and Jesus said it's a matter of the heart issue, so I've already committed adultery. I might as well go on with the act. That is not what he's saying either. This is not a permission. This is a condemnation of just how evil we really are. Matthew 5, 28 again. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So how do we understand this? We have to look at two words. The words everyone and the word looks are in the masculine. And they're meant to demolish the historical view that adultery was limited to sexual relations with another man's wife. Jesus doesn't use the word wife. He uses the word woman. Yes, it means a woman of marrying age, but he, would, he did not say wife. He said woman. He's talking to men because everyone and looks are masculine. He's talking to the men in the crowd. He uses the word lustful. And it's meant to expose the married man in particular who looks as having a desire not limited to sexual for any woman to whom he's not married. Uh, it might sound like a little confusing statement, but let me explain it. What Jesus is doing, he's saying, all of you married men, if you look longingly at another woman, married or unmarried, You've committed adultery. It's not the status of the woman. It's the status of the man now. So Jesus has broadened this to married people. Now, let me say what he's not saying. He's not saying it's okay for unmarried people to have sex outside of marriage. Again, he's not giving permission. He's closing the loop in that area. And we need to understand, this is a big problem when we redefine words in our culture to limit the scope of them. And Jesus is saying, look, um, it's not just married people. Primarily married people, but it's not just. Craig Blomberg, in his commentary on Matthew, said the word lustful is meant to expose the married man who looks as having a desire not limited to sexual for any woman um, not married. And so Christians must recognize those thoughts and actions which long before any overt sexual sin make the possibility of giving in to the temptation more likely. And they must take dra dramatic action to avoid them. Adultery doesn't start in bed. Adultery starts in your thinking. It starts in your thought life. It starts in what you dwell on and what you meditate on and what you fantasize about. It's not just a woman. It's not just a man. It's both. But Jesus is addressing men in particular. Then Jesus moves on and he speaks metaphorically. He uses a metaphor demanding that his followers take drastic action to ensure that they do not make any room in their hearts or lives for adultery. It's time for the church to get serious about the issue of sexual immorality. It's not permissible anytime in a Christian's life or in an unbeliever's life, but they have their own standard, which they'll be judged for by God, and that relates to them and Jesus. For us as Christians, it's not permissible at any time, either in action or in thought, to commit adultery. And Jesus wants us to understand that we have to get drastic about this. We have to be willing to make purposeful and to take purposeful and dramatic measures to amputate 
sinful pleasures from our lives. It's time for us to do, it's time for the church to say, look, enough's enough. Enough of people being involved with people who are, they're not married to. It's enough of the sexual li- liaisons. It's enough of the, the pornography. It's enough of the adultery. It's enough, it's enough, it's enough. And so he uses two metaphors. I'm going to expand it to three because he does in another place. The eye. Jesus starts with the eye. The eye is the gate for lustful thoughts. Verse 29, he says, If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. What we look at stays with us. Images get burned into your brain. And the more you go to those images, the more ingrained they are, but by the grace of God, he can eradicate them from the mind. But I came across this survey done in October of 2014, which says, according to 2014 survey, 77% of Christian men ages 18 to 30 view pornography at least once a month, and 36 view pornography every day. Uh, Let me say this. It's not limited to men. This statistic is men. Women are having an almost equal problem with it. It's a plague on the church. Ecclesiastes 1.8 made this statement which applies to pornography. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing. The problem with beginning a life of pornography and viewing it is that there's no end to it. Now, let me say this. Parents, if you give your children unsupervised access to the Internet, you're crazy. You are crazy. You, your children cannot be trusted. Why well, trust my children? You know, you're stupid. Because they know, unless you're like a computer guru, your children know more about the internet than you do. It's time that Christians wake up. The only way we're going to help to stop this plague of pornography is by keeping our children limited in what they can do on the internet, and they need to be there, we need to be there when they're on it. Parents who buy their children smartphones are out of their living mind. You're crazy. You're deceived. You're trying to trust someone whose hormones are in a state of flux, and they're excited, and they're investigating, and once they go down that road, who knows where it's going to end. The Internet's a great thing. I don't want to see the time turn back. But the statistics of porn sites being developed is somewhere in the realm of 100 per day. It's ridiculous. And it's free. And we need to put parameters around our children to safeguard. It's not just a children issue, but I I want to talk about that because I I think parents can be more gullible than their children. I need a phone. I can do my homework on my phone. You think that's what they're going to be doing when they're in their room at night? I promise you it's not. It's time we wake up. Next, Jesus, intimidating and 
humiliating those around him deals with the next issue, which makes us very uncomfortable. The hand can be used for self-pleasuring, which results from looking lustfully and fantasizing. Understand that self-pleasuring is sin. Self-pleasuring is sin. There are Christian sites that will say that masturbation is God's gift to single people. Don't believe it for a minute. Don't believe it for a minute. It's slavery. Matthew chapter 5, verse 30. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Pornography and self-pleasuring are slavery. There's no end. Again, Craig Blomberg says, Jesus illustrates this decisive action with two metaphorical illustrations. Eyes and hands are the primary offenders in sexual sin. But verses 29 and 30 may be applied more broadly as well. Literal self-mutilation is not Christ's objective. Don't go home and poke your eye out or cut your hand off. It's quite possible to be blind or crippled and still lust. Sexual sin, particularly lustful sins, are unlike any other sin. If I'm a glutton and I deprive my food, myself of food, I will not get fat. But if I am addicted to pornography and I cut off access to it, I can feed myself. It's a trap. And once young people go down that road, only God knows where it's going to end. And it's time for us to be willing to make our children angry that they don't have the internet. It's time. Also, be careful who your, who, who your children spend time with. Make sure they don't have unsupervised access to the internet. It's time we woke up. And we could preach on this subject for weeks, but... We need to wake up to the reality. It's a plague on the church today. If 77% of men, 18 to 30, view it once a month, and 36% of them view it every day, and these are Christians, it's a plague on the church. And it's a shame to the testimony of Christ. Jesus doesn't mention it in the Sermon on the Mount, but he mentions it in Matthew chapter 18 about the foot. I believe the foot is the vehicle which takes one to places where lust can be fulfilled. This is all about the planning. This is all about going. No one views pornography accidentally. Oh, this I, I clicked on this site came up. Yeah, there's also an X button up in the corner that you can click out of immediately. The one who gets trapped in pornography does so willingly. They go there. And what happens is that people begin to make plans to go there. Matthew chapter 18, verse 8, Jesus said, If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to enter, enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. I want you to turn with me to the book of Proverbs. I don't normally read long, long portions of Scripture, but this one warrants it. Proverbs chapter 6, beginning at verse 20 through Proverbs chapter 7, verse 27. Proverbs 6, beginning at verse 20, through all of chapter 7. My son, keep your father's commandments and forsake not your mother's teaching. Bind them on your heart always. Tie them around your neck. When you walk, they will lead you. When you lie down, they will watch over you. And when you awake, they will talk with you. For the commandment is a lamp and a teaching a light and the reproofs 
of discipline are the way of life. Now, think about that. The commands of Scripture, according to Solomon, who failed miserably at the end of his life, the commands of Scripture are for one purpose at this time, and it is sexual purity. Verse 24, to preserve you from the evil woman, from the smooth tongue of the adulteress. Do not desire her beauty in your heart, and do not let her capture you with her eyelashes. For the price of a prostitute is only a loaf of bread. Some translations say she turns you into a loaf of bread. But a married woman hunts down a precious life. Can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned? Or can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? So is he who goes into his neighbor's wife. None who touches her will go unpunished. People do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy his appetite when he is hungry. But if he's caught, he will pay sevenfold. He will give all the goods of his house. He who commits adultery lacks sense. He who does it destroys himself. He will get wounds and dishonor, and his disgrace will not be wiped away. For jealousy makes a man furious, and he will not spare when he takes revenge. He will accept no compensation. He will refuse, though you multiply gifts. My son, keep my words and treasure up my commandments with, it, with you. Keep my commandments and live. Keep my teaching as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call insight your intimate friend. Why? To keep you from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words. For at the window of my house I have looked out through my lattice, and I have seen among the simple, I have perceived among the youths a man lacking sense. Passing along the street near her corner, taking the road to her house in the twilight, in the evening, at the time of night and darkness, and behold, the woman meets him, dressed as a prostitute, wily of heart. She is loud and wayward. Her feet do not stay at home. Now in the street, now in the market, and at every corner she lies in wait. She seizes him and kisses him. With bold face she says to him, I, I had to offer sacrifices, and today I paid my vows. So now I've come out to meet you, to seek you eagerly, and I have found you. I have spread my couch with coverings, colored linens from, the, from Egyptian linen. I perfume my bed with myrrh and aloes and cinnamon. Come, let's take our fill of love till morning. Let us delight ourselves with love, for my husband is not at home. He's gone on a long journey. He took a bag of money with him at full moon. He'll, become, he'll come home. With much seductive speech, she persuades him. By the way, he should have run, but he didn't. With her smooth talk, she compels him. All at once he follows her. As an ox goes to the slaughter, or as a stag is caught fast till an arrow pierces his liver, as, an, as a bird rushes into a snare, he does not know that it will cost him his life. And now, O oh sons, listen to me. Be attentive to the words of my mouth. Let not your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths, for many a victim has she laid low, and all her slain are a mighty throng. Her house is the way to Sheol, or the grave, going down to the chambers of death. No, really, it's just a story. That was for an old time. Got to keep up with the days. If you believe that lie, you're about to be completely destroyed. There's an eternal danger for those who do not radically amputate fantasy, porn, 
illicit relationships or, quote, friendships with the opposite sex from their lives. Understand that most adultery doesn't happen with people who don't like each other. It happens with people who are friends. It's the smile that catches your eye. It's the lingering handshake. And you have to be on your guard. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. A life of continued habitual sexual sin puts your salvation in question. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21. I'm breaking out the middle, but the whole text is there if you want to read it. Now the works of the flesh are evident, and the very first work of the flesh is what? Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality. He lists some more things, which I've taken out. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Purity must be a priority for the people of God. It has to be. See, Christians have a great motivation and power for removing sexual sins from their lives. We have great motivation and power for removing sexual sins from our lives. Uh, one of the things about sexual sins is they make a person feel weak. Not empowered, but weak, enslaved. All true Christians are in God and have the power to live above slavery to any sin. Where our place is in God, not in porn, not in adultery, in God. Colossians chapter 3, verses 2 through 4. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the computer, not on things that walk through the door, not on things you see on TV on things above, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory, if you're in God. Now, I have some things that I didn't have room on your outline to put in, so if you want a full copy of these notes, just see me and I'll get it to you. According to this verse, these verses in Colossians 2, or Colossians 3, 2 through 4, there are three things that give us hope. Number one, we have to be purposeful in our thinking. Be purposeful in your thinking. In other words, set your minds on things above, not on things on the earth. Be purposeful. Surfing the internet almost always leads to trouble. Don't go on the internet if you don't have purpose. And if that purpose is pornography, that's the wrong purpose. Don't go on it unless you need to, to accomplish something good. Otherwise, leave it alone. Set your minds on things above. Number two. Your old nature is dead. As a Christian, you're 
your own identity is now hidden in Christ. That's who you are. You, your old nature, your old man is dead. And you are now hidden in Christ. Well, if it's dead, why do I still struggle? Because we still live in a sin-cursed world. It's the already not yet. I'm redeemed, but I'm being redeemed. And it is progressive sanctification. So let me give you three things that you need to understand about this old nature dead and now hidden in Christ. And what do you have to do to, to live that way? Number one, don't allow that which is dead to become your identity since Christ is your identity. You're not a slave to sin anymore. You are Christ's. And you are in God. Two. Others were not created for your gratification, but for God's own purposes. Men and women, stop looking at others as a commodity, as something for your own benefit. They belong to God. They're not here for you. Three. Jesus, who now empowers you, was touched by an immoral woman and saw her as a soul in need of redemption. That's our example. He could be touched as a man and as God with flesh, he could be touched by an immoral woman and not have an immoral thought. He saw beyond who she was to what her real need was, and her real need was forgiveness. Adultery, pornography, sex outside of marriage has nothing to do with the value of the other person. It's only and always about me. And it's belittling to the other person. We need to get back to the biblical truth that the only place for sex to be pure and holy is within marriage between a man and his own wife. That's it. The third principle that we find in Colossians chapter two verses chapter three verses two through four is that we will stand before the Savior and give an account of our lives. God is going to ask us why we did what we did. There's an accounting that's going to take place. I want to talk to Christian parents again. Christian parents, men and women. Christian parents are hypocritical when they expect their children to be more sexually pure than they are. Parents, if you're having a struggle with lust, if you're having and become enslaved to sexual sins, don't expect your children to live above you unwittingly you're going to give them an example unwittingly you're going to show them what you prioritize and what a, a, a damning thing it will be for them when they find porn on your computer and it's time not to hide it better but to repent of it Psalm 78, verses 5 through 7. Speaking to the nation of Israel, but the principle applies to us. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. It is hypocritical for parents who are involved in sexual sin to expect their children to not be involved in sexual sins. And it's time for the hypocrisy to stop. It's time for Christians to be proactive in faith to be pure in thought and deed.
we also need to understand as Christians that God's forgiveness does not leave a person hopeless. What you were does not have to define what you are because God forgives. There are consequences, but God still forgives. Confession of sin brings forgiveness. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1, all the way back toward Revelation. 1 John chapter 1. Verses 8 through 10. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If you are enslaved to sexual sins, stop lying to yourself and others. Own up to it. Confess it to God first and foremost. Because if you continue to deceive yourself, you only validate that the truth is not in you. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Who you were does not have to define who you are. Again, it doesn't, forgiveness doesn't alleviate consequences, but it cleanses us from the things for which we'll have to give an account on judgment day. Verse 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. confession of sin brings forgiveness. We also need to understand as Christians that God doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. That's the nature of who he is. Psalm 103, if you wouldn't mind turning there. Psalm 103. Verses 8 through 14. Psalm 103, verses 8 through 14. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He, not, he will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. God understands that we are sinners. That's why Jesus died. He died so that we could have the power to not sin. He did not send Jesus Christ to forgive us of sin so that we could continue in our sin. God's forgiveness through Jesus Christ is meant to eradicate sin and slavery to sin and set us free to serve the living God. It, is, it doesn't make sense that Christians would say, I'm in Christ, I'm forgiven, but I'm still a slave to this sin. When we confess our sins and receive His forgiveness, He empowers us to completely obey. Completely obey. Christians, of all people, have the power not to sin. Joel chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Yet even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. 
God's desire for his people is obedience. Obedience out of a pure heart. Not a hypocritical obedience where we obey holding things from him. But obedience from a pure heart. And we're to return to the Lord with all of our heart. With fasting. I think some Christians, maybe most Christians, maybe all Christians, need to fast from the internet for a month. Well, I can't, I have a job. Okay. So, fast for the internet when you're not at work. Well, I have to check my emails at home. Just think of how many excuses we have for going on the internet. More and more and more. Don't be surprised, then, if your children come up with these same excuses. Well, I have to do my homework. We have to do this research. There's a public library with books. It's a novel idea, but look in a book. Instead of Googling your answer. If you are addicted to porn, enslaved to porn, then you need to radically amputate access to it in your life all access to it. It's just that simple. But it's so hard. Then you do have a problem. How many times a day do you need to check Facebook? Pinterest? Instagram? Whatever it is that they do, and beyond that, I don't even know, but there's a ton of them. How many times a day you got to check that thing? I'm, I'm not against the internet. But what I'm saying is, if you're enslaved to it, the only way to become unenslaved is to break the chain. To do some amputation. To fast from it. To weep over it to mourn that has taken you so far from God to rend your hearts and not your garments see God's word is powerful enough to change our thinking and habits the problem is we're not devoting ourselves to it oh we might be reading through it in a year but is it getting into us we're getting into it but is it getting into us are we really meditating on it but I don't understand it. That's because you're not spending enough time meditating on it. When I married my wife, she didn't understand football, for her football was soccer. I don't like soccer. Sorry. I don't like soccer. I don't, I don't understand it. I mean, I, I understand it enough, but it just, I, I cannot listen to World Cup soccer with the volume on. Okay, those of you in the soccer understand that. Those horns drive me nuts. Okay? Um, my wife didn't understand football. So I had to explain the rules of football to her. And she got it. She likes football now. And cheers louder than I do sometimes. The reality is this. You're not going to get it unless you spend time in it. Reading, meditating, learning, studying. Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living and active. Did I say the last part? Did I miss it? Okay, then I'll move on. Hebrews 4.12. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Why do I do what I do? The Bible's got an answer for it. Well, just show me. You find it yourself. It's called read. Really? Well, I'm not a good reader. Then read more. You don't become a good reader any more than you become a good driver by doing it less. That doesn't make sense. We are lazy. If it's hard, we don't want to do it. 
We've got to stop being lazy. Laziness drives us to the internet, which gets us in trouble. Be a student. Read. The Word of God will tell you and show you and help you understand where the problem is and what you need to do about it. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 and 4. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. But they have divine power to destroy strongholds. If you just try to do this through a self-help group, you may be able to not go to the internet and look at porn, but you'll never eradicate the images in your head because you'll keep drawing them back. You'll never eradicate those sensual moments or those looks at the, other, at the opposite sex because you'll keep doing that because the heart hasn't changed. But we have divine power to destroy strongholds. And we have that power because Jesus Christ destroyed every stronghold on the cross. The foolishness of the cross is the strength of the Christian. We need to understand that, that the foolishness of the cross, the world looks at that and goes, how foolish, your, your leader died for nothing. That's our strength because he died not in vain, but his death conquered and destroyed every stronghold and he proved it through his resurrection. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 to 15. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside nailing it to the cross, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. There is no reason for a Christian to be enslaved to sin. None. It's not a chemical problem. It's a heart problem. It's not a porn addiction. It's a heart problem. We have to get to the heart, and that's what the Word does. We do not need to be enslaved to sin. And what do I do if I am? Well, God has given elders and ministers to minister to people and pray for those who are captive to sin. God has given elders to minister and pray for those who are captive to sin. James 5, 14 and 16. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him. He goes on talking about that. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person, that would be the elders in this case, has great power as it is working but it's so embarrassing. You'll never find freedom without confession. You'll never find freedom without confession. Confessing it to God, and if you are still enslaved to sin, confessing it to someone who can come alongside and walk you through this. So our application. From this day forward... I will be a person who's committed to sexual purity. Are you that person? Sign your name. Don't sign it if you have no intention of doing the radical things to, do, to be delivered from slavery to sin. From this point forward, from this day forward, I will be a person committed to sexual purity.
but you can't sign that, I would love to talk with you. Not in a condemn condemning way, but in a way that comes alongside. So to the married person or married couple, here's what's got to change in your thinking. I will thank God for my spouse. But you don't know my spouse. That was not in here. I will thank God for my spouse and strive for contentment. Not entertaining any adulterous thoughts. And, and here's what that adulterous thought looks like. It doesn't necessarily look sexual. It just looks like, I bet that person would treat me nicer than my wife or my husband. That's lust. That's also breaking the commandment to not covet your neighbor's wife. Wishing you had what someone else has or have better than what you have. So to the married, I will thank God for my spouse and strive for contentment, not entertaining any adulterous thoughts. doesn't matter if your spouse is saved or unsaved. If you're in a marriage, you need to be committed to finding joy in that marriage. To the single, I will develop an attitude of joy for my singleness and abstain from that which would gratify me sexually. God is not giving permission for escapades outside of marriage. He's not giving permission for that. What God demands is purity in your singleness. No looking, no touching. Are you committed to that? Yes or no. To those stuck in habitual sins, I, I will commit to getting counsel from my elders even though it may be embarrassing for me. If you're stuck, get unstuck. You can't get unstuck by accident. The more you spin your wheels, the deeper you go. It's just the way life is. And I understand that this has been a little uncomfortable, but it's a reality. The church is in trouble today. And we need to start being men and women of God who are pure, not just physically, but even in our thought life. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that Jesus Christ set us the example of purity. And Father, I thank you that your word says to the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. And it all has to do with being in Christ. So I pray, Father, that we as Christians would strive to live up to the standard that Jesus has set for us, respecting and honoring those around us, not for what they can do for us, but because they're made in the image of God. For any who might be unsaved today, never having Jesus be their Savior, I pray that today would be that day of salvation be honored, Father, as we commit our lives to you, striving to walk as Jesus walked. And we'll praise you in the name of Jesus.